Um, I was making the point in the middle of all that that rugby is at least very conscious of this and they need to be because the lawyers are going to take over in a couple of years' time. And you're like, okay, well, they're definitely getting better. They've improved the, the tackle area. They've been talking about it a lot. And then, actually, just before we get your opinion on this, I want to play everybody else this. It's Jordan Murphy. So let's try the man sent off at the weekend in controversial circumstances. Here's Jordan Murphy's take. Jordan, so much to enjoy about that game, but one thing flashes out from that game, and I'm going to ask you now, the red card for Will Spencer. What's your view on it? Oh, it's a really tough one, isn't it? Um, Will's six foot ten, and he's tackling a bloke who's five foot... Five foot ten, and, and the guy's actually pulling out of it and falling over as well. So his height has dropped. Um, oh, it's, it's a really tough one. At the time, I thought he might have got a yellow. Oh, I thought a red was really disappointing from my point of view. The referee in Tempest was very clear in his decision making. He talked to everyone straight through it, and as far as the letter of the law is concerned, it would suggest that was a red card. So we're potentially going to see that more and more. Your views as a man preparing a team, preparing the big guys to go out there and do a bit of damage, does that change how you're going to be coaching and what the message is to the players? Oh, it's really difficult. You know, Obviously, you get a bloke who's that tall and um, it's very difficult for him to go forward and be flexible and, and bend over. So um, I'm going to try and pick some uh, players who are under five foot um, and it's going to make it very difficult to referee that, to be quite honest, because they, um, you're not really going to be able to tackle anyone, are you? I think, I think the game's gone a little bit too PC a little bit too uh, that, that for me is crazy it's rugby you know Tommy Taylor was fine Di Young stood beside me he seemed okay with it there was no HIA there was no real danger to the player it was a really good shot on a player who probably wasn't and, and you know it's, it's killed the game really what do you think? <sighs> I'm not sure what I think after that um, look I can understand his frustration um, but you know we spoke about it here on Friday with Adrian and Owen about you know high tackles and and uh, the protocols that were brought in last year and, and, and the, seven, uh, the 3rd of January 2017 around head high tackles and protecting players and you know we see with the new directives about reducing the tackle line to under the, the nipple line um, so I can understand his frustration that you know but I really hate this this, these comments about rugby's gone soft and you know we might as well f finish the game and forget about it and you can't tackle anyone anymore i got to pick the five five foot guys yeah because look at the end of the day and I spoke about this with Tunga Fassa's tackle on Remy Grasso on the first test in France we, we spoke about it on Friday didn't we you know players have to think about what they're doing rather than going oh I'm going to bust a fella here with a tackle they've actually got to go well, I've got to go low or I've got a wrap tackle or something that you just got to take it and it will, as frustrating as it is for coaches and players. And look, it's kind of pot kettle with me maybe because, you know, I, I played fairly aggressively and abrasively and I like the physicality, I love the physicality of the game. But if you want to protect players and protect, uh, make the game safer and promote uh, progressive steps around concussion and injury and stuff like that. And if, the letter of the law, that is a red card. It's very harsh on Will Spencer. And, you know, there's a height difference there. He's a second row against a hooker. Um, but it's a red card. So if that guy plays next week now, or a couple of weeks' time, he may get a suspension, he may get it rescinded. We don't know what the authorities will do now. Um, he's got to think about that type of tackle again and, and either wrap a guy or something. Like he's coming out of the line a little bit to put in a big shot, which is fine, but it's just too high. There's contact with shoulder into the jaw and at the end of the day, I think there'll be issues in the future, uh, you know, around concussions and injuries and stuff like that. And we see a lot of players retiring. I, I think it's more highlighted nowadays, which is a good thing. Uh, but... You know, Jordan, I think, saying it's gone to PC, you know, if he had a son out there or if he was out there himself and he was on the receiving end of it, um, it may be different. I can understand the emotion and losing a player and the possibility of the game being totally one-sided then, which it was. And in fairness to Leicester, they played very well. He's just after taking over. They're under pressure. Um, so I, I, I empathise with him around that. But saying it's gone to PC is the wrong type of terminology we want from a coach. We want a coach saying, OK, it's frustrating, it's disappointing, it could have been a yellow, but look, we've got to go with them, we've got to trust the referees and, and the powers that be to make the game a little bit safer. Because otherwise there'll be no rugby the way we know it. If, if this continues, the amount of 
legal actions that will be taken by, by players and by players survivors because like if you look at the way the other contact sports that have had major concussion issues have gone massive settlements involving billions yeah. in America that already during the summer the um, the law society or one of the, the legal organizations had a concussion seminar for their like it's coming a but massive Ger there's a absolutely. ticking time bomb coming Ger what I what I can understand here as a former player who probably wasn't the best technical tackler I cannot understand why we're making excuses for high tackles and oh look there's a height difference here and there and well this fella ran in with a shoulder charge and Sam Kane and Robbie Henshaw two years ago was accidental if it's in your head that you can't go anywhere up around here and you're being coached and policed properly with it well, you've just got to do something different yeah it's not going to ruin the game that we're these massive shuddering high tackles uh, and borderline up around here are going to be taken out that's not going to ruin the game um, in fact, it might. If the tackle is a bit lower, we might see some more offloads and stuff. So people saying this is going to ruin the game and it's gone soft. You can still bust a fill in the midriff or low. Yeah. Um, you can still wrap the guy up high around the shoulders and stuff to stop the offload. But it's the force and the nature of coming out of the line and putting in a massive hit and being up around here. So Will Spencer came out of the line yesterday. And he hit a guy with a shoulder into the jaw. It's a red card. It's very simple. It's nothing to do with PC. And World Rugby are trying their best. And, and to be fair to them, and I wrote a piece in the Indo today about it, there's other stuff going on in games. Guys diving into rocks with shoulders. We spoke last week about the, the Callum Gibbon one, yeah. Gibbons one at Glasgow Munster. If they're policed properly, you, I always think of Joe Schmidt when, I, when, I, when I, I'm talking about this because if a directive of a law or a law is brought in, uh, and a protocol and it's really emphasised that this is the way the referees are going to police this now and that information is passed on to teams, coaches in all competitions Joe Schmidt is the perfect example of bringing these players together and saying we're going to get penalised if we do this if you don't listen to you know what I'm saying and you get penalised well you're risking being off the team. You're going to hurt the team. So we've got to get coaches now to coach them. What, what Jordan Murphy did was tell all his players that it's wrong and, and or that's a wrong call and, and off you go and do it again and I'm going to back you in the, in which the is Atlanta. wrong like and it's, it's football it, that's how football works I didn't see it or my but players we never know about interpretations wrong. and soccer and a tackle and was it late was it a red was it a yellow there's always a little bit of manoeuvre here unless it's really clear cut look to be fair I don't think there was massive intent from the player, but he's got to go lower the next time. He's got to say, well, I'm risking, if I'm coming out of the line like that, just because I'm six foot seven. There's, and yeah, there's no free pass. There's not here. You've got to go lower or else wrap him. Let him come into his chest. He can wrap the player up. He doesn't have to come out of the line and it'll stop some of those collisions and it has to be policed properly. And that directive or the, the protocol changes it was always illegal to tackle high yeah. but there was a massive emphasis put on the punishments and the severity of punishments in January the 3rd 2017 first six weeks of it eight weeks maybe three months it was policed very hard and we saw a very a few soft a lot of soft yellow cards guys kind of grappling from the side and an arm would slip up yellow card you go Jesus that's harsh but I thought we'd have to suffer a bit of pain to get to the point where teams are coaching players yeah. and players just know then if I go high I'm risking it and you go back to the Grosso one that I spoke about on Friday with Owen and, and, um, and Adrian uh, Twinga Fassa comes in with a lot of force now he's trying to put in a big hit but he hits shoulder straight on to Remy Grosso's face if that incident happens again he now has to if he got punished he now goes to think I can't join this as an assist tackler, I've got to wrap or just, you know, uh, soak up the player. I can't be coming in with that massive force because I got punished for it before. But they didn't punish him for that. Um, Grosso broke his jaw. Sam Kane hit him with a forearm across the face. All that was given was a penalty. Yeah. So my piece today, and, and, and look, I'm not an expert on this, but I haven't been out there. If you're given a message that you can't do this, and the risk you're going to risk getting yellow or possibly red or and it's police properly yeah. um, well you're going to have to change and that's not going to ruin the game so this r rubbish that oh the game has gone PC and it's gone too soft you can still put a lot of force into a lower type tackle or else just wrap if you, if you can't get down that low wrap a guy up there's no one going to give a yellow card red card against you for wrapping a guy in a tackle and trying to stop the ball so 
Um, emotions were high. He was disappointed with the game, Jordan, but saying it's gone to PC is the wrong message that has been sent out. And I'm really frustrated by that. And I like Jordan a lot. He's a great bloke, uh, but it's wrong. It was a red card all day long, in my opinion, yesterday for Will Spencer. Um, a couple of big stories from the weekend. We'll talk Munster, we'll talk Leinster, but we should talk about the All Blacks and the fact that, um, unfortunately, our World Cup draw, which looked great when it was made, suddenly doesn't look so good anymore. Yeah, well, South Africa, to be fair, um, you talk about taking your opportunities in a match, and uh, they were fortuitous. They were 12 nil down, then they scored two tries, and they go 19 or 21 12 up. Um, now, they were gifted a couple of scores, but they were. They, well, you know, they were gifted, but they were ready for them. That, the ball that gets thrown, um, the quick line out inside their own 22, at least there was somebody ready to run onto it. So you can, we can see the stats are up here. You know, if you were to say uh, the team on the right actually ends up winning the game, 258 metres versus 624, 59 carries versus 215, 12 defenders beaten, 9 line breaks against 19, you would say autumn, normally that the team uh, with the stats on the left would win the game. But not when you've got a flaky kicker. What happens? Yeah, uh, Bowden Barrett missed four kicks, but if you look at that... Oh, uh, twice. 39 miss, miss tackles from South Africa. Um, and the number of tackles that... 235 tackles made by South Africa, 61 only by um, the All Blacks. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Turnovers one is the kind of the key there. It's nine turnovers one for South Africa and five for the All Blacks. Uh, and then the conversion accuracy obviously does not help either. 33%. Conversion accuracy from kicking um, and zero penalty goals. So uh, set plays, lineouts lost, only one each. Um, scrums lost zero on both teams. What's the point of the scrum anymore? If that's going to be the case, uh, I'm joking. Obviously, before all the uh, the amount of tackles that South Africa had to make and and they're only 25 procession, per, per, percent percent possession. Excuse me, <laughs> um, in the game and probably you know. 75% territory was was um, was in their in their own half um, it was just a surge after surge of pr uh, pressure from New Zealand but South Africa took their opportunities they were abrasive they put in the work rate was phenomenal and they were hanging on right at the end but why New Zealand didn't take a drop goal and win the game they had so many opportunities and Barrett never stepped back in the pocket and, but his uh, confidence must have been shot after missing those kicks I don't know I don't know is it a confidence thing or is it just they felt that they were going to score because they usually do don't they when they're in that position and um, you know it was a phenomenal effort Willie LaRue was sin binned um, you know and they had 10 minutes without him towards the end of the game and they were hanging on for dear life now they got a bit of luck. They it, got a few they did, things went their way. Yeah, like turnovers. Anytime you beat the All Blacks, that's going to be the case. Is is Razzy Rasmus like a bona fide certified genius? Like, is that what's going on here? That they've got this amazing, incredible coach. When you think about the rabble that South Africa were under their previous coach, to now go to New Zealand and win a game against a team that New Zealand have declared their best ever team, like their their own media are handing them the World Cup already and we Razzie walloped them last November in, in Dublin we walloped um, South Africa they were it was embarrassing for them and um, since Rassi Erasmus has taken over I think you know obviously winning the series against England um, they should have won last week against Australia and and to get that result I thought it was amazing during the week he was saying he's under pressure and he might get the sack if, if they lose in New Zealand um, he's, a, he's in there in a six year contract yeah I, I mean, think the great thing that he did with that Munster group for the period he's with Munster is get him to believe in themselves and get that feel-good factor and get guys kind of working incredibly hard for each other. Um, and he's big into the temperament and the mood of the group and making players feel wanted and, and, and believe in themselves. And he's obviously done this now with a South African team who have some incredibly talented players. Um, but they were lacking cohesion. And yeah. You think the strength and the power of some of the guys up front, and he's kind of moulded that together and got them believing in themselves. And to create that result is massive. Now, it's probably one in twenty that you get that type of result against New Zealand, where they just make mistakes. Barrett miss, misses misses the kicks, the quick line out throw, um, one or two missed tackles that New Zealand had. Uh, but South Africa looked like they felt. They looked like a team who felt they could win. 
you know, some of the tries they scored were phenomenal. Yeah. They were brilliant. Have they gone down a different route in terms of style? Because it seems that the bludgeon has gone to a certain extent. Like, it does seem you say it's a 1 in 20 results. And that this was a very unspringbok performance in the way they managed to go about getting victory. That this has all the hallmarks of a complete fluke. Um, they've changed, yeah, definitely. They're not trying to run out over people as much as they were. And look, that's playing to their strength. Um, they moved the ball a lot. On Saturday, they weren't kicking it. They felt probably, I think they felt that they had to go and play against New Zealand and they had to play rugby and move the ball a bit. So they pollard a 10, passed a lot. Um, they, they still scored a, a, a beautiful driving yeah, ball from the line yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. And um, What worries me is that they've got a 20 year old winger who is like about to touch down in the corner and decides, no, I'm going to skin behind the goal line, I'm going to skin one of the All Blacks and touch it down under the post. You can just see Jacob Stockdale getting ruined in that manner. Is that what you're trying to say? Oh, I'm wondering, Jacob Stockdale touches that ball down and goes, yeah, thanks very much, I've just scored my try. It's like, there's just that evolution. The game is creeping forward and you need to make sure that you're creeping with it. It's perfectly set up for Ireland to get knocked out in the quarterfinal stages next year is what you're trying to say. Oh, we'll wait and see, but uh, that's a long way off. Um, but yeah, look, South Africa are on the up. Um, you know, he's done a great job in... in, in uh, in getting improving them now, can they back it up and uh, you know get consistency in their performances? But the whole world, I think, that was a good result for rugby. Mm. Um, New Zealand are a phenomenal side. I think if they played next week, I wouldn't like to be playing New Zealand next week. And well, it was fitting, wasn't it, as well, with the Argentina result? What was the first win in Australia in thirty something years or something? Like days after Pichot's comments the other day, saying that international rugby is dying. This was a timely boost for the sport globally. Well, except that about like, five people showed up in Australia for the Australia game. And the fact that, uh, like, Jordan Murphy's comments yesterday as well, and <laughs> that the sport is actually in its deepest crisis ever. But uh, ultimately, the Rugby Championship covered up some of those flaws. Let's talk about the Pro 14 a little bit. Uh, big weekend from um, Munster's, Munster's perspective, sticking up 49 points. The first try that we've seen from Joy Carberry in red. Uh, Leinster also sticking up uh, 50 burger as well on the Dragons on Saturday. So uh, those two provinces, as we expected, are beginning to kick into gear. Yeah, um, Ospreys had a second string side over, which was uh, um, probably the reason for... for So Munster were very good, Ospreys were poor. Um, That's last week's result, I think, is it? Last week's yeah. results, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was a good performance and it was a kind of timely boost and Carberry scoring the try as well was, was, uh, was huge for him. And, uh, you know, when you've come to a new team like that... Um, he showed that bit of X factor and that bit of talent he has and pace and it was Conway in the quarter final of the Champions Cup exact replica. Mm, I wouldn't say an exact replica, but similar. Yeah, the, uh, he see. But ju the great thing about Carr is he sees a gap and he sees some space. And uh, it was a very dominant performance overall from Munster, I think. And uh, they'd be very pleased with that. But obviously, having him starting, the crowd loved it, and uh, he got a a big reception when he came off as well. Ulster winning 28-7 down in South Africa, just an attendance of 5,000 at that one. Um, so they, the results are up, and Leinster 52, Dragons 10 at the RDS, Munster 49, Ospreys 13, and Edinburgh beat Connacht 17-10. When you're losing like that, does the losing bonus point, is that the type of thing that you're looking for on the road that they didn't? For Connacht, I think that that's... Um, yeah, that's not a bad result. Edinburgh, I thought, were very strong. They probably... They should have beaten Ulster the week before. Um, they have a good side, and, and, and Richard Cockrell's done a really good job with them. So I thought that's that was a good result. And when you go away from home against strong sides like that, who have all their internationals playing, um, there'll be a fair few positives to take away from that. Now, they were hanging on at times, but they showed a lot of grit and determination to get a losing bonus point. And they're the ones that point that will be a boost towards the end of the season. It may get them into a playoff. Um, so I think that was that was a decent result from. Yeah, J just one other thing from the weekend. Just James and Gibson Park got man of the match for Leinster. Like Luke McGrath, is he Ireland's second choice scrum half? Is Kieran Marmion Ireland's second choice scrum half? Where is James and Gibson Park basically? Or, or John Cooney, I think. Yeah. Or John Cooney when he is Irish qualified next year, Gibson Park. He's a very good player, and uh, he won a Super Rugby title with um, in New Zealand. So I think he's um, he came here with a fair bit of pedigree. He's probably had to, um, you know, Luke McGrath is, is the number one let's scrum half for Leinster, but to have that back up, and we saw it with Redden and Boss for years, how they can kind of make those changes and have that, that depth. Um, he's a very good player, great footballer, good line breaker, 
Um, but will he come into the reckoning? For sure, I think. Uh, when he becomes Irish qualified, it might make him a stronger case to to put more pressure on, on Luke McGrath. But I, I like Luke McGrath. I think he's a great player. I think he was brilliant throughout the whole season last year. And uh, I think Marmion is probably second choice. Um, I think John it's, Cooney's it's, it's done up for grabs though, isn't it? it? It is up for grabs. And I think uh, Joe Schmidt will keep them all on their toes. Yeah. And keep them all believing that... You know, there's a fight on here, and uh, it's good to have that kind of depth. Cooney's but I think, obviously, the Conor Murray yeah. level is here, and they're they're below it. Yeah, which is still a, an excellent level. Yeah, um, um, Cooney has the ability to kick, obviously, uh, and is also quite brave, as we saw at the weekend. Um, he was posting pictures on his Instagram afterwards, uh, taken high and tight to a new level. Is it 14 stitches? That's yeah, sort. He's had a really good start to the season and uh, to kick penalties two weeks in a row. 41 points in three games. Um, yeah. Um, <coughs> to win the games from against um, Edinburgh and Scarlets, I think, is obviously massive. Uh, Ulster have been patchy. Yeah. I think the two home games, you know, they were vulnerable, could have lost both of them. Um, but getting the results is, is probably the most important thing, given everything that went on there last year. Uh, with Dan McFarlane coming in as well, trying to put his own stamp on things, and it'll take Not a little bit of time. Having a preseason as well, I think yeah, he wasn't there for him, and that does have an effect. People don't realise that. Getting to know the players, getting to have chats with them, um, put patterns in play. Yeah, like, um, so I think look, uh, three wins is great for him. It's a positive story, and to go to the Kings, um, it was a tough game yesterday. They'd be disappointed probably they didn't get the. The, the bonus point it took them a while to get the three points and it was in the balance for most of the game but um, they'll be pleased and uh, they play the Cheetahs now next week there Alan good stuff thanks very much cheers sir. we'll have more rugby during the week of course with uh, Alan